Thanks for stopping by CSEC Biology TCP. Today we're going to be looking at excretion and homostasis. We're going to be looking at question number three from the January 2014 Human and Social Biology CSEC examination. Now we are just going to jump right into this question. Figure six shows a diagram of a human nephron. Now the nephron is also called the kidney tubule. It is found pretty much within the kidney and is responsible for filtering the blood. Now this is one of the diagrams that we will need to know for our examination. It is called a nephron as I said before. We need to know the function of all the parts and of course to be able to identify the parts. So it's very important that we understand that this here is the afferent arteriole while this here is the efferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is usually bigger than the efferent. Here we have the glomerulus, the Bowman capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and of course the collecting duct. So make sure that you know the parts of the nephron and the function of each part. Let's hop on into the question. So name the parts labeled A and B. So we can see clearly that the part labeled B is of course the collecting duct. But what's the name of a part labeled A? The part labeled A is of course the Bowman's capsule. So within the Bowman's capsule, you're gonna find the glomerulus. Bowman's capsule. Next question. State one function of each part labeled A and B. So the Bowman capsule is a site for ultrafiltration. It collects particles that are forced out of the glomerulus. So you're seeing the glomerulus there, which is a network of blood vessels. And here it is collecting from this network of blood vessels. It's coming here for the process of filtration. Then for the collecting duct, it would be collecting urine as a waste from the nephron or from the part, various parts of the kidney and transport this urine to the pelvis, uh, eventually the ureter, to of course be expelled via the bladder and the urethra. We move on down to the other question which wants us to look at the kidney as an excretory organ. And we're supposed to name one other excretory organ and the substance it excretes. So the organs we're looking at here, we gave you a number. We're looking at the kidney, the lungs, alimentary canal, and the skin. Now the kidney is responsible for removing urea and water. The lungs, carbon dioxide and water. The alimentary system or alimentary canal it is responsible for removing bile, mucus, salt, and of course water too. The skin would agree is responsible for removing salt and small amount of urea, and it too will be removing water. Hence we can see here the real reason for us consuming water on a regular basis as we are always sending out water via excretion and there is no process in the body that takes place in a dry environment. So water is a very, very important part of our diet. And we move on down. We are now looking at a dialysis. And one would understand that once the word dialysis comes up, one would be thinking about kidney failure. Uh, if you are aware of what that which we refer to as a renal clinic, it means that the kidney is not working. And might I add here that the only time that a person is usually found with three kidneys is when there is somewhat kidney failure and one has to be implanted. In that case, unless one of the kidney inside is somewhat uh, inflamed, then it will not be removed. The additional kidney will just be added. Let's look at this question. As a result of diabetes, wow, big killer, Tommy's kidney have malfunction and needs renal dialysis to control the volume and composition of his blood. Figure 7 shows a simple 
representation of the inside of a kidney dialysis machine so let's have a look at the kidney dialysis machine here it's not a question that most persons would be familiar with or paying attention to but like we said this is our exam preparation so we're looking for those questions that might have been a little problemsome for some person so here we're having the dialysis fluid and it is pretty much entering the machine and it is approximately the same uh, salt and glucose concentration as would be found in the blood we have also on this side here the blood to the patient so the blood is going to the patient there and on the other side we have the blood from the patient and it is passing through the dialysis machine and we're seeing the dialysis fluid coming out here so here we have the dialysis fluid going in and it has pretty much the same concentration of glucose as a salt of the blood and here we have the of course blood going back to the patient here the blood entered from the patient and the dialysis fluid is coming out but it's very important to note here that we have a partially permeable membrane or one might see a selectively permeable membrane represented in this dotted line going across and these dots here represent the blood flowing through the system now if you observe this dotted line they would have separated the dialysis fluid from the blood let's get on down to the question based on the diagram in figure 7 explain why a partially permeable membrane is needed in renal dialysis now once we're talking about a partially permeable membrane the concept of photosynthesis should come to the forefront so a partially permeable membrane separates blood from the dialysis fluid allowing unwanted particles or substance to pass out of the blood to the fluid it does not allow the blood cell to pass out hence the membrane allow the blood to be cleaned by its partially permeable status so you understand that there must be a concentration gradient there that would have caused the particles to move out because we are relying on the process of osmosis to assist us here with cleaning the blood so the permeable membrane there our partially permeable membrane will allow some substance to leave the blood but not all so it will of course do the selection so you are watching CSET biology TCP the other question is why is it necessary for dialysis fluid to have approximately the same glucose concentration as Tommy's blood now this is easy you would have recalled the concept of a isotonic solution a hypertonic solution and a hypotonic solution now it is always true for the process of osmosis that a salt water fish cannot be taken from the sea and placed in fresh water that will cause the fish to die as the concentration of salt in the fish is greater than the water that it is entering so the water will move into the cells of a fish and of course cause them to rupture now which same is true we cannot take a freshwater fish and place it into the sea or as what is likely to happen is that the water will leave the cells allow the cells to become plasmalized and eventually the fish will die there are exception of course with the salmon that is able to move from salt to fresh water because of a special mechanism to get rid of the salt or to regulate the internal condition now for this question it is very important to ensure an isotonic environment is maintained in the body and the isotonic environment means that pretty much a concentration is similar on both sides and cell will not burst if we have an isotonic solution and when a cell bursts via too much water entering we say that it is as a result of hemolysis now nor become 
plasmalized when a cell become plasmalized you find that it is shrinking on the inside so that can be very very dangerous because that suggests that there's not enough water for our chemical reaction if any of the two condition occurs it could cause Tommy's death so we really don't want to have a IV fluid being uh, of course injected into anyone and it will not of course cause the cells to be in a state that we refer to as isotonic Tommy's kidneys were normal explain how the hypothalamus would control the water content of the blood when blood solute concentration is high so we want to find out how the kidneys would work with the hypothalamus if of course his kidney was well well that is pretty simple the first thing we need to look at here is the word solvent now solvent is going to refer to the salts or the solid particles there for this case and of course we have to also talk about the solvent so here the blood has less water and the water there would have been the solvent and more solute which is of course the salt now asthma receptor in the hypothalamus will stimulate more ADH uh, to be secreted in the blood hence the individual becomes thirsty and of course the individual will be think, drinking more water now the kidney will also reabsorb more water in the blood as a result there will be less water in the urine making it more concentrated now the reverse would be true if the solvent concentration was of course greater than the solute so this brings us to the end of this question from our January 2014 paper. I am Mr. Wilson from CSET Biologic TCP. Please be reminded to like, share, and of course subscribe. When you subscribe, click that notification bell and select all so you'll be notified when there is a new publication. Remember to join us on a Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday at 5.05 p.m. for live streaming from the Caribbean island called Jamaica.